Well, hello, Jeff, and hello, Lee. And here I am, Namali. Um, Jeff, we haven't heard from you in a long time in the popular podcast, The Daily Evolver. And so we thought, why don't we get you engaged for a bit? <laughs> yeah. It's the end of the year. How are you, Jeff? I'm doing great. I, um, yeah, I took the summer off. And the fall off, apparently. <laughs> and here it is, December. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I'm, 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 my New Year's resolution is to get back in the saddle of doing the Daily Evolver um, in some form. I'm still playing with it and working it out. But um, yeah, I mean, it's it's what I do. It's 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 I look at the news, I read the newspaper, I, you know, and I think integral thoughts, I think, you know, and that's what I've been flogging for all these years. So, you know, that's still happening. And um, yeah, uh, apparently people are interested and I will uh, uh, pick up the mantle again. Yes, very good. Well, hopefully, maybe even just connecting with you today might inspire you a little bit to yeah, yeah. talk Let's, again. Yeah, yeah. Let's <laughs> see how it's going on this crazy planet. Yeah. yeah. What were you doing other than uh, since you were not doing so much sort of podcasting? What What else kept you busy? The last well, in of terms of anything that would resemble work, I was um, I was posting on Twitter and continue to. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I, I really actually have come to like Twitter and, mm -hmm. um, I find it to be a, a place for people to, you know, I, I, I often say we fight and friend our way forward mm -hmm. and on Twitter and I guess other social media too, because I've never, you know, Facebook and the other ones, I can't get by my antibodies. Um, <laughs> for some reason I can with Twitter. Yeah. And I've been on, I've been a lurker for years, but posting uh, that that's been interesting to me. Mm -hmm. uh, other than that, I've been a house frau, you know, I've been yeah. cooking and gardening and, you know, taking care of the family and gossiping, you know. Yeah. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Very uh, good. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm, re I'm, a, I'm a retiree. You know, I'm going to be 69 and, um, you know, it feels right on schedule to me. And it's funny because even talking about it, you know, life developmentally mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I grew up in a culture, a traditional culture where old people didn't achieve, you know, they weren't about work or, you know, doing new things. They were about being in the family and taking care of their lives and taking care of their loved ones and, you know, keeping food on the table. And there's something about that, that it sort of comes naturally to me to go there at this age. Those were all my role models and I had a big family. Uh, so, you know, my challenge <laughs> is to, you know, also take what gifts I have seriously enough to, you know, continue to give them. And, um, and I don't have to go east of Broadway, which is a block east of me. Yes, so. <laughs> exactly. One block east. <laughs> yes. So um, it, it suits my um, um, Enneagram five sort of personality. Exactly. But it's it's funny. You, know, you, you and I talk about this all the time, Namali and Lee, you, we have too. It's just the but basic operating systems that we have are, you know, they're, they're real you know, and that, that's how we see the world. And one of the great things about integral consciousness is we can observe ourselves doing it, you know, and that helps because that creates a new space of choice and awareness. But, you know, that horse is still there and that horse is going in a certain direction and, you know, you can be a more or less skilled rider, but, uh, you know, you can't change horses apparently. <laughs> wow. very true even if you so, don't like your horse even if you got kind of a nasty horse no i'm just kidding it's we all have beautiful horses right but uh you know we gotta be good riders so speaking of your particular horse jeff you, you indeed you do have a, a talent to look at the world and look at the news and to reflect on it from an integral perspective so that's what namali and i would like to invite you to do today as well looking back at uh, to, uh, 2022. So 
uh, you could highlight some of the most significant events for you, Jeff, and shine an integral light on it from your perspective? Yeah. And, um, you know, let me just say that an integral view is um, a view of the evolution of consciousness and culture, that it's a, it's an idea that, that uh, human, humanity is um, uh, evolving through stages of development and collectively, individually, so the cultures are also evolving. And so that's how we at Integral, uh, or with the developmental view, uh, look at the world. That's what we bring to the party. It's not the only story, but it's a really important story. And it's not being told really very much outside of the integral or developmental community. So that's, you know, the piece I'm trying to bring to the party. And I think one of the things that um, uh, sort of is a barrier for people thinking about development that, you know, the world is evolving to a better place, you know, towards goodness, truth, and beauty is that the mechanism of evolution is that the evolution to goodness is often done via things that are bad and things that are ugly and things that are false. It is a fallen world in a way. That's sort of the beginning. That, that's the first um, realization of Christianity is, you know, Adam and Eve story. You know, we, we fell from grace. Um, in Buddhism, the first noble truth is that life is suffering. And so I feel like that has to be put on the table, first of all, is that this is, this, you know, this universe that we know, at least, this planet is fraught with difficulty. And um, most people are suffering. And I am, you know, we all are. That's sort of a starting point. And, you know, I think even of um, the Guinness Book of World, World Records for a, a book on the New York Times bestseller list is a book called The Road Less Traveled by Scott Peck, a uh, famous book, very important book in my life. And the first sentence is, life is difficult. So, yeah, that, there is a, that is a, an important starting point. And then, you know, we can see the, the movement of the you know, evolution as we, you know, work our way forward. And we can see it geopolitically. I mean, one of the things that um, we can note as developmentalists is that the war in Ukraine, that is fundamentally a war between two developmental worldviews, one being autocratic, you know, that would be it, it's somewhere in the traditional and warrior empire, you know, that that's a center of gravity, at least of Putin and the leadership of Russia. Uh, so that's all about it's not about convincing people. It's not about leading people in, you know, this Obama kind of way where you, you know, just present something that they want. It's about ruling. It's about building your empire. It's about being secure. And um, and it's not you know, you don't want to join the modern world in, in a certain way. I mean, you can, in the exteriors, it could be trade and, you know, you see China's sort of a flavor of autocracy um, where they're knitted into the economics, but they don't want that liberal piece. You know, they don't, the, the idea of shared power is anathema to an autocrat. I mean, look at Trump. You know, it just doesn't, it, and it's not it just, they just don't get it. It doesn't make sense. It's frightening to them, you know? Uh, and so that's, that's the center of gravity of the Russian monolith. And, um, and then Ukraine, um, is, you know, they have their problems and they had all kinds of political consternations before the war. And in many ways, a, a fight in their own country between autocracy and modernity. But the center of gravity is modern. You know, there, it's, it's aspirational modern. And it's really, um, you know, so beautifully personified in Zelensky. You know, how cool is he? I mean, he's postmodern. You know, he's a comedian. He's like, it's meta on meta. He was the star of a show about being a comedian who gets to be president. And, and then he really actually is. <laughs> and um, it's really something. So that, and, and so, and, and then you see the modern world being what we would call the center of gravity, modern world, Western Europe, you know, Japan, Australia, um, NATO, you know, the EU coming together in resistance 
to this, you know, new reviving of autocracy, military that Russia perpetrated. And that's interesting. And, and I, you know, in some ways, from an integral point of view, the, the sort of developmental problem that we have to deal with in, on any subject is red. You know, guns, social media, you know, the, the, it's the red underbelly <laughs> that is that, that we have to watch out for because it's violent. This is we're talking about the warrior slash empire stage of development, which is completely evolutionarily appropriate for 95 percent of human history, you know, <laughs> or a lot of it, at least. Once we evolve beyond red, so we get civilized in the traditional stage, and but we still fight each other in terms of my civilization versus your civilization. And then there's a world-centric um, attitude that arises that is what we have in NATO and the West for the most part. You know, there's every stage arises on the underbelly of the previous stages. So that it's all still there. But you know, in the modern world, we, we realize that there's there's something here worth fighting for. Separations of power, personal freedom, material plenty, a freedom from the triumphalist narratives of the previous stages, you know, self-expression, uh, that these are, you know, we actually have to engage our red in order to protect these things. And, and so, you know, that's what we're seeing. And it's been, you, you, you can see it in the geopolitical realm with, you know, the response to Russia and, you know, we'll see how that goes. But you can also see it in the United States with the, you know, the latest election where, you know, the more moderate centrists won against the Trumpists uh, with the, you know, congressional committee, with basically how the modern structure held against an assault by pre-modern forces, or authoritarian forces. And that's, you know, one, that's a stage of development that we're at. Uh, and as humanity right now. And, you know, again, we can see it. And in, in, in that way, 2022, can you say that that's a good year for modernity? In a sense, you know, we saw modernity rise. And of course, modernity, this is one of the things that autocrats and, uh, you know, people who have the heart of, you know, they, they actually want to follow one person. They don't want, they don't want these other people in there. You know, modernity is constantly chaotic you know it's everybody's and then you get into post-modernity with social media and all these voices and all this assault on values and aggressions that are allowed how do they allow that you know autocratic people don't get that uh but you know here we are and in the messiness of modernity uh, there's there's it turns out that there is a backbone I'm happy to see that. And this, this this year has been good for revealing that. Well said, Jeff. And I don't know if you read uh, Rob Smith of Integral Life, uh, his piece about the Russia-Ukraine conflict. He said that Green has the power to convene, so the postmodern um, worldview level of development, and that the power to convene was basically the response of um, many uh, nations to come together and, for instance, to impose all sorts of sanctions on Russia, and that the autocratic perspective tends to undervalue the power of higher developed structures because they don't present themselves uh, violently. Yeah, that's well said, actually. Yeah, what are you afraid of? You know, they're, they're not willing to fight. They're, they're soft. I mean, this is what Hitler thought, too. You know, he's looking over at, at the movies of the, in the United States and you know, it just thinks they're a bunch of weaklings. So yeah, they don't get it because we don't present violently. And that's really very key to a real center of gravity of modernity is violence is out. You just can't do it. I mean, of course, the red underbelly is still there. Uh, but we also see, and, and I think this is interest should be noted from a developmental point of view, that even in tyrannies, uh, there's developmental progress. Putin's Russia is not Stalin's Russia. 
Uh, Xi's China is not Mao's China. This is a big development in terms of just the respect for individuals. I mean, a lot of ways, you know, more to go. But this this is also something that we can note and, you know, factor in, you know. So when I think of the resolution of the Russia-Ukraine war, first of all, I don't know. That's sort of an embracing of the postmodern view where, you know, on social media, YouTube, particularly or Twitter, any number of uh, sources in the metaverse of this global brain that we have. I mean, I can listen to military es- experts on both sides. I can listen to diplomats on both sides. I can listen to the man in the streets interviews. I can listen to philosophers and uh, actually, actually see the war battles close up, but they have these cameras on these drones, listen to soldiers, listen to soldiers who have, uh, who have, uh, you know, uh, left the military and uh, run away. And I mean, it's just an amazing, I think of how presidents of the United States, Kennedy, during the Cuban, Cuban Missile Crisis, he had a, in the Situation Room, he had, you know, eight or 10 people that he could listen to. We can listen to everybody. And there's something about that. There's there's a wisdom that arises out of that where you don't necessarily clench on any one perspective uh, or have an idea of how things ought to be. You still have an idea of how things ought to be and you, where you hope they go. And I, I I noticed this in myself. I have my own red strata that's like, fuck Russia. You know, I love when I see them blowing up the tanks until I think about the soldiers in the tanks because I have a, you know, green sensibility. And, you know, I, I could see all of this stuff online for me, but one of the things that I think, you know, de facto our leaders do take this into account is that the whole system is evolving. And sometimes it's like good old Pema Chodron says, you don't want to bring things to a painful point. You want to allow um, there, you know, things to slow down for people to get it, you know, to, for people to grow, even in Russia, you know. So uh, I just want to factor that in uh, as I think about the the uh, resolution of this war, that it will be some kind of a solution that will probably be unsatisfactory to all who have, you know, a mono perspective. That's probably where we'll end up. And uh, and it'll be a different world after that. This is another one of the sort of obscene truths about evolution is that conflict is very evolutionarily potent. Evolution likes it in a way. I hate to say it. And that's true of our own personal lives, too. You know, if we think of what really has made us grow in our lives, it's not things going well. You know, I blame God for that. I don't think that was a good idea for creating this universe. But here we are. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What are some other, um, you know, world events that you recall as having, you know, made you pause for a little bit and sort of think about it in that integral way? For example, um, actually, you know, Lee and I were thinking of, you know, what were some of the big things that happened this year? And there's like Iran, which is going on right now. Classic, classic, traditional, modern uh, fight there and like it's almost like wow it's it's really something to watch and all the young people the women you know taking off their headscarves and men joining them in their struggle you know so certainly iran is really interesting um certainly i mean u.s politics is never boring we had the last final January 6th hearing yesterday with criminal referrals against Trump. Um, you know, I'm wondering about AI and, you know, GPT-3 and like the the way artificial intelligence is mm-hmm. doing the things that I don't even understand how to explain. But then how about, you know, again, back to U.S., like things with guns, for example, what about Biden? How what do you think about Biden perhaps? How do you feel about the global kind of situation in relation to COVID? How that has evolved? Um mm-hmm. social media, Twitter, the 
uh, the NFT dude, uh, Sam Bankman Fried, you know, yeah, uh, and the culture wars, Roe v. Wade, um, immigration, you know, the yeah. what a, yeah. so climate, you know, the whole climate discussion, um, yeah. China's zero COVID policy, which came to a bit of a halt. It's like, oh, I guess we might have to evolve that policy or you know, change that policy. Um, and then there was just all these other things like the the, the crisis in the UK with uh, trusts and all the, like the, po the political drama that unfolded in, in the UK. Um, prisoner swaps, Brittany Griner, and I forget the Russian guy's name, but then all the sort of the prisoner swap stories um uh, Shinzo Abe killed Imran Khan was uh there was an assassination attempt against Imran Khan in Pakistan the Chris Rock slap like that's that was all this year different. wasn't it that was this year yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. well wow, talk about an eruption of red <laughs> yes the 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 sort of the ongoing supply chain disruption from a sort of that lower right struggle uh struggles that are going on the China Taiwan tension, you know, and yep. Nancy Pelosi choosing to go to Taiwan and what that created. Um, the death yeah, of well, the these Queen, could, yeah, all these, oh, the the, and all, of course, the the World Cup, and you yeah. know, the, the having the World Cup in Qatar, and all the things that it was sort of enlightening the world too around LGBTQ issues or like can we sell beer in the stadium and and then the sort of what they're calling the sports washing the beauty of the sport takes over and the issues are kind of swept under the rug and um and speaking of speaking of sports I'm also realizing i've always thought about this how sad it is that the united states doesn't have global domination uh, or you know competency in competing in team sports at a world level they always do well at the olympics and you know all that but i always think if only america was the united states was good enough to compete at global levels in the in one of the three big major global sports because i don't think anything brings a country together when they're fighting at a global level for the same side and i've yeah. often felt how sad that america almost never really gets to experience that yeah yeah what's it's the um well yeah I'm, no we we you know, we, we, we think we're our own thing. You know, we got, we got, we have American football, we have baseball, we have, yeah. you know, basketball, you know, it's our culture. We had two oceans, you know, on either side of us. Uh, we but well, one world war two, we didn't have to pay attention in the way. And there's a downside to that. To totally. I mean, the, um, the, the, the liquid community, around this world cup and you know just that sense of world centric awareness is i i think you know america will grow into that i think that that'll happen at some point and, and i think this world cup it was probably a big step in that direction because a lot of americans were completely entranced by yes it. yeah and, and you know that's that's the beginning and that's part of you know, that's part of America moving into a world centrism in the interiors, where we pay attention to other cultures in, in a way that we didn't have to, or we didn't think we had to anyway. And other yeah. cultures have, you know, there they are with each other. So, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's cool to see how um, all of the things that you talked about, the whole list there, they can all be seen as this struggle forward. Um, as, uh, you know, into more uh, worlds, uh, you know, uh, modern, classically liberal, then sort of this woke, um, world-centric, multicultural 
kind of move in humanity that is happening right before our eyes. I mean, if you think of social media, even five years ago, it seems like forever ago, or the things you could say or the ways you could think that, um, you know, I, I, I credit woke um, worldview for a lot of that, where, uh, you know, the sensitivity to everybody's personal presentation, their own individual, you know, sexual, racial, all of that is, you know, that's becoming more and more, we're, we're seeing past those things, uh, I think, in a way that is really fruitful. I mean, of course, every stage of development is brought online by its fanatics. I think they have to be resisted. Um, think of Christianity, you know, the fanatics, the fanatics in, in the warrior empire cultures. I mean, again, this world, you know, but the fanatics do play their role. And, um, you know, so we see it. Um, let's just start with your list. I think I made a note of all of them. So we have Iran. Yes, absolutely. An epic struggle between traditionalism and modernity, traditionalism being fundamental religion. Uh, uh, and, and they had a traditionalism, pre pretty early traditionalism in the sense that women had to be covered. You know, so that's the politics. But meanwhile, there's the culture, you know, and Iran was a very educated, is a very educated culture. Persia has this amazing history. You know, and Persian, it's important as we integrate the world that Persianness be, you know, fully fluorescent, you know, all the Russianness, all of it. We want all of it to be in, in the game, in the future, in the sacred world to come. But in the meantime, so that we have this uh, morality political state and we have all the young people on Twitter or on uh, TikTok. And, you know, just getting fed images of people in the rest of the world. This never happened in traditionalism. People could go hundreds of years uh, without having a whole lot of change in that kind of uh, worldview. But now they do. As often happens, I mean, one of the keys of moving into modernity is a liberation of women into the public space, you know. So women get to be whatever they want to be now. They don't just have to be home and with kids. And that's there. That's who's leading this charge in Iran, and you know we'll see. I mean, there, there's a resistance, but there's also it's like with COVID in China. Uh, at, at one point, the um, the culture had this uh, you know backlash against the zero COVID policies, and the leadership kind of has to change. I mean, they really do. Even in autocracies, you have to pay attention to the will of the people. And they do. So I think that's, uh, you know, we'll see where Iran goes. They may be able to repress. I mean, these countries get good at that. Uh, but the, the long-term the, the long result is locked in that um, Iran will move into modernity probably sooner than later. And then you have a country like Qatar, where all of a sudden, uh, whatever it was 100 or so years ago, a literally tribal um, society where, you know, people, nomadic desert dwellers, uh, find <laughs> pitching their tents on an ocean of oil that the rest of the world wants. And so they have this, you know, big move into modernity in the sense that they just money flows in and they can build skyscrapers and they can build a modern society. But that interior still working its way up, you know, and it was it was fascinating to see the conversation around Qatar. You know, you know, they'll, they'll never be the same again, Qatar, Qataris. And it's hard to even over, it's hard to overestimate the ways in which uh, social media and just the media verse in general is educating people hard to even wrap your head around i mean how fast it's moving not just in the, in the states but everywhere in the in the in the world africa you know everybody's got a phone they're all paying attention there's problems with that you know you get we, we've often talked about one of the sour spots in history is when you get modern technology in pre-modern hands you know uh like weaponry for instance uh 
hopefully we'll not blow ourselves up, but we can. That's kind of an, you know something to note. Let, let, let me just even jump ahead to climate just for something a, a little different. Um, what I am noticing is that, well, first of all, let me just say that uh, climate apocalypse is a feature of the religious aspect of climate, you know, apocalypse believers. Uh, you know, that's just part of that world-centric realization that, you know, we've got one planet here. I mean, I saw this is you know, something that I'd point out that it happened in, I guess it was the UK yesterday, um, a UN uh, ag agreement among 200 countries to save biodiversity. Um, that there's a there's a lot of realization around, uh, you know, the rapacious uh, downside of modernity that just goes in there and takes takes no culture or nature into account when there's, you know, mining to be done. That's, you know, the last hundred years. And so there has to be a realization and human beings realize things religiously. We just do. We just it's built into us that we're going to. You know, we we're sinners, and we've done. You know, we've committed these sins, and we have to atone. And we, if we don't, we're going to have an apocalypse. And so that whole climate story has been very much downloaded into progressive culture. And you know, I, in some ways, I feel bad about that because you know, I I have some a couple kids in my life who are very demoralized. They don't think there's a future. I hate to see that that religion voice on kids until I think about, well, wait a second. When I was a kid, I was raised that if I was bad, I was going to burn in hell for all of eternity. And, you know, I survived. <laughs> Every stage has its religion. But here's what I'm noting in 2022, that there's a move, and I've seen it in the New York Times a couple times, where th there was an article a week or so ago where um, it was actually a, um, I think it's the environmental minister of Canada, who used to be an environmental radical activist. And now he's inside, you know, and he's, he's, it was, he was talking about how, you know, we still need to mine, and we still need to have feed the, you know, energy and we, but we have, we have, we have to take the planet into account in ways that we haven't before. And, but that rather than the doom fear based model of religion that we need to move into it that there's a we're doing all right we actually have made progress and that there's a way forward that's going to work or can work and so that there's something that's inspiring about that that actually integrates this is integral you know the integral stage is what happens after post-modernity where we try to integrate the best of you know the realizations of the previous stages so we want modernity to continue because modernity, you know, it triples lifespans. We don't want to sacrifice the natural world to the human world. And that's the realization of post-modernity. And so I do see The Economist had a cover story on how climate doom story is being challenged and that there's actually something positive and a way forward. So, you know, I think we will continue to fight and friend our way forward on that issue. I, I'm happy to see the change in the culture, you know, just glimmers. It's really good technology that also helped with the latest sort of the breaking news with the nuclear fusion. Um, yeah. That's the orange doing its thing the in the yeah. good, in the good positive way as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, um, you know, and of course, uh, solar and, and wind and nuclear. Yeah, fusion. Nuclear plants are being re brought back online, and nuclear technology that is, you know, considered safe. There's there's no Three Mile Island option where they melt down and pollute the whole scene. So, you know, yes, we will. You know, electric cars, uh, LED light bulbs. Funny if you just even look at humanity as an organism. You know, if you sort of step back and just look at this. Uh, humanity on this planet it's amazing to see how we're responding to the challenges that we face sometimes i just marvel at it you know 
zooming out and looking at uh, humanity as an organism or as a, as a person, you could say that when people have to change their behavior because their health is endangered, and we could make the uh, analogy, of course, with humanity and, and the climate uh, crisis, then people often have to experience some level of depression and doom and um, thinking of of death and destruction before they are motivated enough to make um, sustainable choices. So in a way, so I think what we're seeing is a natural phenomenon uh, in the, in yep. the human species. Yep. It, it's an interesting thing because this sort of, again, our interiors are, I don't know how we are often motivated unless there is a little bit of shouting and like the squeaky wheel gets the the squeaky wheel gets the oil concept right so i guess i guess like the the climate is a very serious issue and we all have to be doing everything we can to fix it um and at the same time don't fall into the very very depressing we're completely doomed, so we might as well just give up uh, also. Yep. So it's this, it's the sort of the polarity there is like work your butt off and also calm down a little bit and let's yep. get our heads straight. And is that what I'm hearing from you, Jeff? Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I, I don't think that it was wrong, a wrong turn that we would have a religion of climate uh, apocalypse. I think it's actually it was right on schedule. Is right on schedule. I mean, the new Avatar movie, um, mm -hmm. the old Avatar movie, biggest movie of all times. It's just, uh, in some ways, it's sort of cookie cutter apocalyptic. But on the other hand, it's all over the world, and people of of all stages of development are, are getting this kind of download that you know art is art's a funny thing. It can penetrate all kinds of intellectual resistance or you know whatever and um so you know it's all just part of the awakening and the in the uh, of of humanity to the you know the next challenge and and i would also say that developmentally that um just part of the postmodern affect is depression and maybe even a little bit of nihilism uh, and that may be right on schedule, too, because at some point we had after World War II, it was clear to the people who survived it uh, that um, we could no longer rely on these narratives of my culture is supreme or that my God is supreme. In fact, God was gone after, you know, modernity killed God. Um, so we have, you know, if you, if you think about developmentally, we move from a stage where it's like Ken Wilber said, I always love this. He said, we move from a stage in traditionalism where God is everywhere to a stage in modernity where God is nowhere. And so one of the sort of problems with that is, you know, then who are, who are we? What are we doing here? What's the meaning of this? You know, and so there's a certain anxiety that arises in modernity because we don't have that religious, um, you know, foundation. And then we move into post-modernity, which is an act of deconstruction of all truth claims, absolutely appropriate evolutionarily. Um, but it's like, then what do we believe in? You know, and it'll, it, for a, a, a lot of particularly academic post-modernity, it's a ratcheting back down to red. It's like, um, well, then it's all just power. You know, everything is reduced to power structures. Uh, and um, and there's truth to that. You know, the, it's funny. The power is very much alive and well, and a lot of uh, the wheels turn just because of the force of the power. Uh, but th th this is where integral uh comes in because integral does offer a story that re-enchants the world to me you know at least that you know 13.8 billion years ago something arrived arised out of nothing and has complexified itself to this moment and to this uh you know the culture that we're in and um and we can see that even though you know it's been arrived at through a lot of lies and violence and you know ugliness 
that we're living in a better world, that we're, we're that, that, that there's it's a more decent world where people have, you know, enough to eat. They have the indoors. You know, we're about to have <laughs> 13, 14 degrees below zero here, Namali, in Boulder. And, you know, it's not going to be life-threatening um, for the humans, at least. So, um, you know, th th there is something about... Um, the next stage of development that wants to, it's like that New York Times article, that wants to see a promised land, that wants to see that we're actually getting somewhere and that we can take heart in that uh, and, and not be stuck in the deconstructive, um, you know, sort of lost worlds of modernity and post-modernity. And we see that a lot. I mean, this is, I saw a, um, uh, a tweet, uh, and I'm forgetting who, did it, but it was somebody in the integral scene. And uh, they said that it's now clear that the benefits of social media were not worth the downsides. And um, I don't agree with that, but I will say that there are tremendous downsides, particularly for young people uh, of having this unlimited uh, uh, world of social media where, um, you know, people aren't putting the, their miserable foot forward. Some are. Actually, it's kind of interesting to see on Twitter people who are just so honest about their suffering. I mean, I actually am amazed by it in a way. Uh, but for the most part, for kids and stuff, it's Kim Kardashian. Or that, that's I'm probably hopelessly dated with Kim Kardashian. But it's, you know, this... Um, uh, this, this, this status thing, this idea that everybody's happy but me, <laughs> you know, everybody's good, that I think is, um, you know, we have to look, pay attention to. It's it's like, I think we've talked about this before, actually, but human beings are so deeply um, wired to connect with each other. You know, we just really like to get in the game with each other. And all the, you know, communication is just, you can't get enough of it. And it's a little bit like calories. You know, we're just, we're just, um, you know, programmed to go for calories. So we like sweets and we like fats. And at some point you realize you just can't have all the food just because there's food all around you. You can't eat it all the time. And there, there's an, there's a, an arising understanding that, um, you know, you have to put the phone down at some point. And with kids, maybe you have to make them put the phone down. I don't know. I mean, there's a, 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 it's, uh, one of the Republican senators just uh, put forth a bill that all porn sites have to verify age. It's like, yes. I mean, when did we vote on that an eight-year-old can see the most wretched pornography that the human mind can conceive of? I don't get it. You know, I mean, it's so, yes, there has to be a reckoning about uh, social media and particularly kids. You know, I think it's, you know, kids are always a flashpoint. You know, everybody wants to get the kids. <laughs> and you know you could see why that's all i think that's been true for human history so anyway i mean that's that's part of the mess that we're in right now and figuring out and you know i'm all for that uh i think it's mike might be mike lee from utah uh who put that forth i think it, maybe it was but um you know I, yes let's do that how hard could that be you know will it be perfect no but um, right now, it's like astonishing. And then, you know, you, you think of these pre-modern countries where our satellites are pumping this down into their families and their kids, you know? No. So anyway, um, I, 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 I think that's a reckoning. We're just, I think that's one of the things we're working on right now. True. And Jeff, just for people watching who... Um would like to follow you on Twitter. What's your Twitter handle? At Daily Evolver. Yeah. So it's that uh, continuing the Daily Evolver brand. And how about Twitter, huh? How about Elon? 
Yeah, what's I mean, what what's your thoughts about <laughs> the whole Elon saga? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm putting together my first podcast for the new year. I'm, I'm, I'm going to cover him at least to some degree. You know, I think he's an interesting, um, I think integral developmental psychology really helps us to understand him. I think he's some version of a spiral wizard, if you will. To be a spiral wizard, it's sort of a little bit of a jargon, but it's somebody who can operate at many stages of development at the same time. And so, you know, you can see Elon, it's hard to imagine somebody who has uh, had more actual impact on the world for good than Elon Musk. You know, in terms of particularly third person, in terms of technology, in terms of the electric cars and the batteries and the rockets that can land and the uh, the, the Starlink that has been so consequential for Ukraine that kept their internet going. I mean, how do you overestimate the contribution of a person who kept the internet on at Ukraine, in Ukraine, you know, through a Starlink system? So, you know, he's got that in spades and, you know, in, in many ways towards very progressive go goals of, you know, and, and in terms of energy and communication and all of that good stuff. So he can operate there. He, but what's interesting about him is that he can also operate on the, the uh, what we would say, the lower levels. And we, we see this in um, successful people often. Uh, there's a certain lack of empathy, uh, lack of being able to read other people. So, you know, what you do is you go in, it's, you, it, we were talking about this um, before, it's like, you don't really persuade, you rule. You know, it's like Putin versus Obama, you know, it's not, it's, it, you, you rule. And so you go in and this is how it is. And, and, and if you're right more than you're wrong, you can really create something because there, there's a certain part of all of us that actually I mean, maybe not all of us, but I can get it. I can see where following a big daddy who's really, or a big mama, who's really knows what they're doing and really has a vision that I want to follow. I don't want there to be a separation of powers here. I want that person. So he's he's managed to do that in four or five different industries at the same time. I mean, I really, it's hard. He, to me, expands the idea of what of what a human being can be and do. It's like that dog on 60 Minutes that uh, Anderson Cooper had, the, the, the dog chaser that can find any one of 600 toys. It's like it blows any idea of what dogs can do. It's like that's what Elon Musk does with humans. Uh, so he can and he can do that in that sort of authoritarian way. Uh, but then what's also, I think, really interesting about him, and this is the part that scares me because it's red. And red is scary, and it ought to be scary uh, because it's um, you know it's unpredictable, it's chaotic, uh, you know, not violent. You know, it's it's like you you have people like him and Trump. They're both they both have this ability to go red, and 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 so red is this um, you know particularly when it's in the context of being civilized. These aren't violent people, you know, but they do violence to the. Uh, any kind of um, settled thought, you know, basically it's like, look at me, um, you know, they're, they're uh, uh, upending the apple cart, they're breaking the China, they're um, inconsistent, they're, uh, it's just, it, the currency is more attention than it is even winning, you know, in a way. I think Trump, for, for instance, right now, he's enjoying this, he'll enjoy a trial, if the Department of Justice um, indicts him, you know, uh, because he'll have the attention of the world. So does Elon Musk. It's like, I, I, I really, in a way, resent this, but I have to check in every day to see what Elon's doing. And that's, I remember that was like the Trump show for the last five years, where every day Trump would have a new episode you know, where he's going up against somebody or he's just causing chaos. And there is something powerful about that and that, that I want to respect from as an integralist, where there's one of the ways forward is to just get in there and bust things up because things get calcified. 
and um and it's not pretty i'm not sure that they are doing it with any kind of self-awareness um you know i don't know i i really don't know i mean in with both of these guys i don't know whether they have self-awareness around it or not but they are forces of nature in that way that you know if you think back in the warrior and empire days you you woke up every morning and who are you going to fight I mean, fighting was what you did. You, it wasn't even about winning. You know, you could lose, but you still fought. Uh, so that's that. I think there, that that's one of the things that I would also notice about Elon Musk. So that he's really able to operate on all these levels, which of course makes him into a spiral wizard. And there's something about him that's integral, you know, in terms of. Um, uh, but, you know, it also reveals something about development itself, uh, both in cultures and in individuals, is that it's chaotic. You know, the, the people who are even willing to go red, you have to keep an eye on them. You have to pro provide some boundaries for them. Uh, or, and so this, this is sort of what I'm, um, you know, yeah. reading with him. With Twitter, it was interesting when he just recently, just yesterday, I guess, uh, posted, you know, who should be the CEO or should I step down from the CEO, yeah. CEO position or something. Um, I don't know if you noticed that Lex Friedman po uh, tweeted saying, give it to me. You know, Lex always yeah. talks about how he wants to spread love through yeah. Twitter. So it's interesting. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess we can talk about leadership in general, that if someone, um, whoever is at the top does matter, you know, oh, and yeah. Lex, Lex is this, I do think it will be amazing if Lex Friedman would become the CEO. <laughs> I know. He, no, I would yeah. love it, I guess. I mean, part of it is he's also an engineer, right? I mean, he actually that's knows his a, way That's around. the main thing. Yeah. I mean, he's yeah. an AI specialist. Um, expert in AI and researcher in AI, but also talks about love. <laughs> you I know. know, I want people yeah. like him and Tristan Harris to be yeah. the kinds of leaders that really take over. We definitely need integral thinkers taking over these kinds of roles. And that's a, yeah. that's a big ask. And who knows when that will happen. And so, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree. I mean, I would, uh, we'll see uh, country, you know, different regulatory bodies come in. And, yeah. you know, if, if they do regulate pornographers, you know, that's a good move. Um, mm -hmm. The Europeans are doing regulations of social media that as, a head of, as they always are uh, ahead of the game. Uh, and um, yeah, so I, I think th that's, that's happening and people are mainly people are becoming hip to it people are realizing wait a second i don't want to be manipulated like this and i can see how i have been manipulated by this what did you say namali something about engage outrage or engagement by enragement yes engagement by enragement that's programmed in so far yeah, exactly you know? that's that's what it is yeah 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 now, it's to keep you, know, you that, there longer. So when you yeah. are these days enjoying Twitter so much, it's also AI doing that to you. Yes, exactly. Now, and I can control it to some degree. Yeah. But I will say that when I um, spend an hour or two on Twitter, I will often have that kind of um, feeling like I've been to a war zone. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I don't, I don't want to be glib because war zones in the real world, non-virtual world, is a whole different ball game. Mm -hmm. But still, you know, it's about defeating your enemy in any way that you, you can. And there are, you know, dead bodies strewn about, and uh, so to speak. And, the, and, and this is actually something else we can see developmentally, is that uh, the, the center of gravity of human engagement moves from physical to subtle and you know if, if things uh, go according to integral theory to eventually spiritual uh and we of course are doing all of those all the time but uh 
one of the things, one of the gifts of modernity is that we do get sort of the physical needs handled. And to the degree that we become fully modern, we no longer go to war with weapons. But the war continues. But yeah. now it's the war of ideologies. And it's actually a world, of, it's a war of worldviews. If you, you know, go on Twitter, you can see the worldviews fighting. You know, you can see the, tr the traditionalists, you can see the, you know, the woke postmodern, you can see the people who just want the trains to run on time, the modernists. Uh, and they're all in there. Um, and yeah, sometimes it's like, damn, I need to get out of here. And fortunately, you can, <laughs> if you're not completely addicted, and I'm only partially addicted. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, but I am partially addicted. I get it. And I see it. And it's like, wow. You know, Just why am I continuing to feel like Skinner's pigeons? I keep pecking at the keyboard. It's like, I want to stop, but I can't. But anyway, sorry, Lee. <laughs> I was going to contextualize your tweets because I've seen some of them. And um, it's it's not when you say um, it's a sort of a fight, uh, fighting environment or a war zone. That What I've seen of your tweets is that you bring a meta perspective to the people with whom you engage. So basically you frame things in a more inclusive way. So you typically when um, somebody takes a position, you add a position to make it more nuanced. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, that sort of seems to be what I do more or less naturally. Um, and, you know, when I, I like that you use the word inclusive because this is uh, one of the ways of looking at the move from postmodern to integral is that, you know, postmodern wants to include people of that have been marginalized, basically, people who, you know, different races and genders and fluid, all that kind of sort of thing. Uh, but they still want you to be postmodern. <laughs> if you're traditional, they don't really want you in the tent. Um, so one of the things about integral is it's an inclusivity of worldviews, where you can, you have, you, you, you yourself have an integral consciousness that where these various worldviews, you can see them. You can see how they grab you. You can see how you're captive to them, but you can on a good day, see them instead of be them. And so you can see the goods and bads about all of them. And that's one of the things that, uh, you know, I see other people doing it too online. I see uh, people who are sort of bored with fighting for their own ideologies. This is one of the fruits of the, um, you know, of the arena of combat is that at some point, you know, it's like a teenager, you just sort of outgrow it. And people are, I see people who are, you know, th there's a concept I never heard of five years ago, maybe an even three years ago, but you see it all the time, steel manning. You know, I guess people talked about it, but I never heard about it. And now it's a thing. And it's the idea of uh, rather than uh, define your opponents by their worst qualities, you try to, you know, present their best qualities. And that's the thing on Twitter now. Not not that big, but it's bigger than it used to be. And um, I want to notice that because I think that's something that's happening at the point of cultural evolution is that there's a there's a move towards post ideological, you know, where I think our grandchildren uh, will look back on this era as the the great ideological war, the era of the ideological war warfare. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and they'll roll their eyes. It's like, why were they so worked up? Let's just get on with it. Let's have a, you know, let's have a nice day. You know? yeah. Yeah. Uh, but that's, that's us. And here we all are. Yeah. And there's a lot more to go. I don't know if it's grandchildren. It's the way evolution is accelerating, it could be our grandchildren, probably for sure our great grandchildren. But, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, the, you know there's, it's like Ken Wilber would say is that, what would he say, Namali, it's two thirds of the world is still pre-modern, basically, traditional or earlier in terms of their center of gravity. A lot of the world is. And yet, you know, this internet is, the, the, we're getting this sort of integral sensibility that we're adding to it. It's quite chaotic and causes a lot of, troubles but um you know you can see evolution doing its work 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we should probably wind down, but um, so just real quickly, maybe uh, before we let you go, how do you feel about Biden? Well, I just read uh, a, uh, a column in the New York Times. Uh, I, I don't know if you guys see it, but every week, uh, Brett Stevens, who's sort of their center right guy, uh, has a discussion with Gail Collins, their so, sort of center left uh, columnist. And they they're friendly, but they you know they fight, and it's <laughs> it's great. But um, one of the things they talked about was um, that there is um, what was it that you the, uh, that you just asked me because this I was going there. Biden, just a little. Oh, Biden, yes, yes, yes. Biden. That, yeah. that Biden is going to use this Christmas holiday uh, as a time to reflect on what he's going to do. Because, you know, the election, the midterms behind us, and, you know, now we're looking forward to the um, um, the presidential election in 2024. And, um, and he's going to decide that he's going to retire, and he's not going to pursue the presidency. Um, I hope that's true, simply because I think he's too old. And I think that's um, showing up. But it also is interesting to see what he's done and the accomplishments he's made. And, um, and there, there's something, there's a lesson there. And I could, and I, I'm happy to learn this lesson because I'm old myself or older than I used to be, that you can sort of lose words and you can get a little scrambled, but your bigger judgment actually, and your bigger wisdom actually is still there. And you can, you know, sit back and sort it out and, and make a better decision that, than you might have when you were in your earlier years. And I think that's true of him. Uh, and, and yet he's the politician. He is, uh, you know, he has to keep his base happy. Uh, you know, he has to be more extreme in many ways than I would want him to, that most people actually would want him to be. But he has to keep, you know, it's like Trump with his MAGA people. He has to you sort of have to feed that beast. Uh, but yeah, all in all, I think that uh, Biden will be looked back on as a very successful president, and I hope he um, turns it over to who? Uh, maybe Jared Polis, Namali, <laughs> our governor. You know, he he wants to be president, and he's kind of a, he's a very popular uh, Poot Pete Mayor Pete. You know. I actually think even though a lot of people dislike Kamala Harris, I actually wonder about Kamala Harris and Pete Buttigieg running. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 um, I wish I liked her better, but um, <laughs> I sure like uh, Pete. Pete, Pete I, Buttigieg. I would, I'd vote for the Pete ticket if, if, he, if he was the president. That's actually one of the problems. I think Kamala Harris has not ignited in a way that I, I don't think most people really, if Biden ran with Harris, that would be a big problem for him, especially at his age, because mm. whoever is his vice presidential candidate is going to be very consequential. And is he going to want to drop her? Boy, that would be a problem for the base. So yeah. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I, well, Pete Buttigieg so I, I think a clean yeah. slate would be better, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and she yeah, can get in the she can get in the arena and fight for it. And you know, history is yeah. funny. You know, a moment. Yeah. Sometimes people rise to the moment. I'm good if she would, yeah. but um, you know, I think there's some yes. other people to consider. Yes, the 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 Pete Buttigieg is is far from unfortunately being able to run because I think even within the Democratic Party, there's a lot of people. He, he can't get the black vote, for example, or the no. Latino vote, for example, that kind of thing. No, so, no, yeah. No, no, yeah. It's, you know, a good politician, that's the hand he's going to have to play. Yeah. And yeah. It, also from the right, you know, do, uh, is the world ready for Pete and Cheston and their children to walk up to the stairs of the White House? And we have yeah. a first laddie instead yeah. of a first lady? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, who knows? I mean, we're moving fast, but that may that may be a stretch. And all, that's also true for Jared Polis. You know, yeah. he's yeah. married to his husband and they have two kids. Yeah. So 
um, you know, yeah. uh, and also on the right, uh, you know, it looks like Trump's going down. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can't believe I'm even saying that. <laughs> you know, every time you think you got him, he slips away. So, I, you know, I'm say, I say that provisionally, but it doesn't look good. You know, even with Tucker Carlson saying he wouldn't, uh, he won't, he won't say he would support him. That's, that's significant. Mm-hmm. And of course, everybody thinks it's then Ron DeSantis, but that's what we thought it was Scott Walker. And who, nobody even remembers Scott Walker anymore. But he was the one that everybody thought was going to be the Republican nominee until he wasn't. Uh, So um, it's it's very this is a big reset for the country. These this next presidential election. So uh, I'm I'm riveted by it already. Yeah. Anything you want to say, Lee? No, I I can't really contribute to the American politics uh, discussion uh, meaningfully. <laughs> no, so. anything else? Yeah, something else. No, no, I I just want to uh, thank. Well, what's the, going on uh, in that crazy uh, Britain, the UK? Well, that was Still quite. Um, well, I I mean I've been following it tangentially because I I live in the Netherlands, but and I'm originally from the UK, but so I hear some uh, murmurings of what's been going on, but. As I understand it, just like Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, they had this sort of basically very niche idea of how economic uh, economics works. And Liz Truss basically took that same economic uh, thinking and tried to apply it to the UK of, of today. And it resulted in enormous financial instability and a large number of people who did not want to support the direction in which uh, the government seemed to be moving. So she was um, basically forced to resign. And this is all, of course, after Boris Johnson uh, resigned. And one of the things that happened in the UK was a newspaper printed a, a lettuce and uh, and a photo of Liz, Liz Truss and said, who will uh, spoil first? So the lettuce or Liz Truss and it was somewhat comical, of course, that Liz Truss was out of. <laughs> I remember uh, that uh, actually. Downing Street before the lettuce had spoiled. So, so, so yeah, there's been some uh, upheaval, and then of course she was replaced by someone with a very firm grasp on economics, but who is also, of course, uh, a, um, a multi-millionaire. And there's more stability, but there's also a lot of um, displeased uh, voices around the uh, the fact that. Some, there's someone in power who has very little feeling with the majority of people who are suffering amidst rising um, gas and, and other energy prices. So uh, th- that's what I what I know. But um, I, of course, also hear from uh, these things from very partial news sources. So um, I think yep. we'll have a more complete picture in, in a number of years when we can analyze the full situation. Yep. That's my take. Well, at least we that. have King Charles III. True. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, the monarchy is, you know, talk about a developmental view. You know, we have this traditional, even the empire, you know, uh, that sort of empire red thing that uh, we had prior to World War II. And uh, and then, you know, that falls apart or relaxes. And uh, and then we have, um, you know, Charles, kind of postmodern, uh, environmental conscious. We have William, seems to be kind of more sort of secular, middle of the road. And then we have Harry and Meghan, mm-hmm. our postmodern royalty, the royalty of green, you know, sensitivity, victimization, um, you know, transgression. Uh, and you know that what it, it's it, it it's all playing out in this one family, which is such a stru- easy structure for humans to relate to, and get really interested. So it's like a soap opera for the in some ways the world, for, but for sure the Anglo world, and fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Well, maybe we close the call, Jeff, by asking you if you have any kind of a. Uh, a prediction or a desire that you wish to see for yourself or for the world uh, or for the integral community? What 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 would you like to say as we kind of enter 2023? What will be interesting to you? 
Well, I, I think, you know, what I try to do is just notice the uh, updraft of uh, emergence. You know, I, I notice it in myself that there's a always a new Jeff wanting to be brought forth. There's something new arising in the culture, in the world space. And um, I think keeping just noticing that at this point is uh, that that's my mission. And um, so, you know. I guess I'll keep doing that for the duration. But thanks for asking. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So thanks, Jeff. And thanks, Namali. And, and Jeff, also thanks for going into Twitter every day and fighting the good fight for all of us. Yes, yeah. it's my pleasure. It's I, I mostly find it fun. And yeah, thank you, Lee Mason. Thank you, Namali Pereira. And I encourage people to check out your practical integral site and your wonderful coaching and all the good stuff you're doing. And uh, it's really been fun to be with you. Well, thank you. Excellent. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. We'll see you another time. All righty. All right. Have a good Bye. day. Merry Christmas. Bye. Happy holidays. See you next time. All right. Bye.